The sun slowly rises over Paramaribo, the capital of Suriname. Pedro is preparing for a long trip. He has kept his childlike spirit, even if he has just become a grandfather. Oh, I don't like this mess. Pedro and his wife Francesca are not like other grandparents. They're gold hunters. Go on, get going. Every year, they set off to bury themselves for months at a time in their mine in the Amazon forest. Being careful won't kill you. Go that way. This is the only type of vehicle to manage the road where we're going. No other vehicle could. Well, unless it's a tractor. Take it down, take it down. That's good. Put the brake on. You can let go. It won't fall. Yeah, it will come down. Gold has paid for their daughter's educations. And they hope to earn enough to secure the future of their grandson. He's our first grandson. He's a man. But he won't go into the forest like his grandpa. No, no. He'll play football and go to school. He's too young to go into the jungle. He might get ill. Pedro and Francesca's journey will last several days. 200 kilometers through the jungle on the road to gold. Suriname is difficult to locate on a map, but it's not an imaginary country. Suriname is in the heart of the Amazon. A jungle country, 163,000 square kilometers covered with virgin forests. Very few roads, a few tracks, and notably, a lot of large rivers. Waterways where canoes are the trucks. Suriname is the least populated country in the Americas with barely half a million inhabitants. The majority of the population lives in the capital, Paramaribo. Suriname is a land of adventure. To get from one village to another, one usually takes not the road, but the river and its unpredictable waters. Ooh. Suriname was a Dutch colony largely built on the African slave trade. Their descendants still live there and now work for the gold diggers, the Garimperos. 15 to 30,000 men from neighboring Brazil. Suriname is their El Dorado. After a six-hour drive, Pedro and Francesca reached the shore of the Moroni River. Look up. Hey, collect all the barrels and, and put them in the canoe. They must now load 2,000 litres of gasoline, three tonnes of diesel oil, 100 litres of water, dozens of kilos of rice, vegetables, potatoes, enough food to last at least three months. They still need to get the essential quad bike on board. Over 300 kilos in a canoe that is already dangerously low in the water. Pedro is hardly reassured. Do you have a life jacket? Oh, yes. I have a problem with water. A problem? What's that? You can't swim? Uh, no, I'm scared. <laughs> Francesca, aren't you scared? No. 
So, Francesca, you can swim. Almost, not 100%, but if I fell into the water, I wouldn't drown. Pedro financed this expedition with the money he made from gold last year. Everything he has, he's plowed into what's on board. But the old canoe is overloaded, and the water is already seeping in. And the rapids are close by. Here it's calm, but further on it's rough. There are more waves. That's why I wear the vest. The river level has dropped significantly, following the year's severe drought. The silhouettes of the rocks are a constant menace. A large canoe sank here, near this cove. Now we're getting closer to the smaller rocks. The guy will have to steer the canoe using one foot on the rocks and the other in the canoe. Mind the rocks. Look out. Mind the rocks. Now the canoe would break up if it hits a rock. <laughs> yeah, mind out. You're going to hit the rock. This is a real nutcase. What Pedro and Francesca feared has happened. The overloaded canoe is stuck on a sandbar. Hey, come on, friend, come down. Get out of the boat and to help us. But the boatmen are cautious, not jumping without seeing where they put their feet first. If your foot goes between two rocks, you break it. You break it. Yeah. So when you jump, you need to know how you jump. And you know? Yeah, I've done this many times. Too late, the boat has drifted. It's now sitting across the current. The engine is not powerful enough to move it. If it capsizes, it's the end of the trip. Hold the boat, hold the boat. Go on, quickly now. Get up ahead. Get up in front, quick. Tie that box up so it doesn't fall off. The situation worsens when the canoe touches bottom. Everyone, including Pedro, jumps into the water. Not for too long, though, as there are water holes. One hour later, the boat moves a few centimeters. It's enough to refloat it. fate causes one of the engines to fail. A 
And if that was not enough, it's almost dry. Pedro notices a leak in one of the tanks and the loss of dozens of liters of diesel. There's a hole here. I now lost the entire amount of diesel. You need to fix this thing, otherwise you lose even more. We'll stop the canoe at Bongotapo. And I'll put on a plastic washer. Mongotapue is a village in the jungle not far from the Moroni. It's where they hope to find a new engine and repair the leak. I'll put a piece of cloth and start to uh, block it up. And then I've got a really wrap it around tight. Uh, we won't arrive in camp today. My husband is worried. He doesn't feel well. Uh, I think I'll give him a pill so he can sleep for two hours. Uh, or even all night and all of the day. <laughs> and you're calm? Oh, yes. Oh, it's better to stay calm. Before, I used to get very stressed. Now I prefer not to. Do you like this kind of life? Look, you know, if you have ambition, you should fight to achieve it. And somehow they're achieving the improbable, locating a replacement engine in the middle of the jungle. We lost two hours waiting for the engine to get here. Next, we'll install the new engine and get going again. The canoes set off at full speed. Pedro is adamant about arriving at the midway camp before nightfall. One hour we still have to go more. Okay. Yeah, it's gonna be dark. How is it to go in the on the river by night? It's dangerous, huh? Yeah. Because at night you can't see the the difference because difference. it's night. Yeah. How the how the current will go and it's difficult to anticipate. You can do it to captain? I hope so. <laughs> I keep my fingers crossed. Now it's a matter of trust. I'm afraid the boat's stuck. The level of water is low because of all the rocks under underneath. Look, look, you see? You see all the rocks? They're everywhere. You can see why he can't go faster. No. I don't like to navigate at night, but uh, on we go. It's not much fun to be here. Travelling comes to an end for the day. We're arriving at Kakaba. We'll sleep here and have a wash and get something to eat. We've traveled a lot. It's been a long day. I'm glad we arrived. It, uh, it's been a hard day's work. And tomorrow will be even trickier. His last words are ominous. in West Suriname on the banks of the Corentan River.
a light pierces the night. It's a small boat from a distant village, Apoera. The villagers sailed all night to reach here. It's low tide, and the pontoon is located three meters off the ground. The 30 or so passengers are a little nervous. This pontoon doesn't seem to be for a remote village, but a proper town. A minibus picks them up. But to get to it, there's a mud path to cross. There's never been any casualties, but last week the passengers killed two poisonous snakes. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Fucked up, man. Wood is fucked up. It's soft, soft. Soil is soft, too much water. they head towards town. To get there, the boat passengers have made an incredible journey. Leaving Apoera, their village in the Amazon rainforest, they have taken 24 hours to get here just to go shopping in the big town. Nua Nikari, 14,000 inhabitants. Like Suriname, Nua Nikari is a multi-ethnic city. Five communities live together peacefully. Muslims from Java, Indians, Chinese, and Arawaks, who were the first to settle here. Like the humans, the gods too seem to live in harmony. The passengers arrive in town at around eight in the morning. They have a lot to do and little time in which to do it, as the boat departs again in the late morning. Felix wants to sell his pineapples in the market. Back home in Apoera, all you need to do is just bend down to pick them up. But here, they're worth a lot of money. The market at Nua Nikari is straight out of a painting. The city people love Felix's sweet pineapple. I'm a regular. This is the fifth time I've been here. This is the best pineapple in the market. But the inhabitants of Apoera come mainly to New Nickery to stock up on food supplies. Once a month, Malik. 23, raids the supermarket owned by Madame Wei Chi. Okay, okay. I buy some uh, groceries for home, back yeah. home. So, uh, like I buy uh, like, uh, flour, vegetable oil, coffee creamer, and coffee. And so, why do you buy here and not in Apura? I tell you because uh, Apura is a little bit, bit expensive. Yeah. So it's better I come here once a month and uh, this will keep me up for the whole And this month. will keep me for the whole month. And for your family? Yes, for my, me and my family. Yes. yes. Uh, 
I'm marking my goods. So the so, so that why? The, why? you know because a lot of people buy stuff. So just to just to know your stuff, you just put your name. Four hours after their arrival in the city, the passengers are once again on the muddy road to the pier. Marcos, the captain, has bought a nice flat screen TV. He's asked a friend to help. He just he have a four wheel drive, so we make ask him to take me there. No other car can go in there inside. The captain has no doubt this form of transport befits his rank. The passengers, though, are wading through. You just look and you just take out our picture good. <laughs> But as in the fable of the hare and the tortoise, there's no use hurrying. And the passengers overtake the four-wheel drive. Real difficult. Too many. Difficult for the people to walk here and travel here. Finally, a tractor comes to help. Their problems are far from over. The truck that is transporting the goods has now also got stuck. Come on, this way. As the hours tick by, all sorts of things show up on the boat. There's even a coffin. The loading is underway, but the captain fears he may have to stay in port. Water is very low, very, very low. So we have to wait, maybe. When they finish loading, and we can see if we can come out there. Because with this water, we cannot go? No, 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 right now. Why? It, it's slow, the boat's uh, stuck on the sun. We are stuck now? Yeah. The old engine lacks power. But with humans lending a hand, the good ship Idabali wants nothing to do with it, and it doesn't budge one inch. There's still one possibility. Come on, guys. Let's go. Just a few hours behind schedule, the Ida Bali reaches cruising speed. to an um, Apura. It's an hour, I think it's gonna be something of, uh, I think, 230 kilometers. 
the river, to the river. But like I said earlier, if it was to the road, it will be only 80 to 90 kilometers. But the river is, you will see it. It's full of curves, yeah. Suriname has its own sense of time. It's best not to be in a rush. The jungle imposes its own philosophy of life on the locals. But it's far from plain sailing. In Suriname, almost all of the few paved roads lead to a pier. From here at Achoni, there are no more roads. To get to their village at Langu, these men and women have a tough journey ahead. Across the waterfalls at Azinodopo. And then, the ones at Bongo. Three hundred years ago, their African ancestors, fleeing slavery, took refuge behind the walls of water and stone. But where once waterfalls were their protection, these days they've become their tormentors. It's impossible to negotiate the falls in a canoe. The only way is to go on foot, carrying all the cargo. The smartest have everything planned. The others carry their goods as best as they can for almost a kilometer. Mind the mosquitoes, they're really big out here. Further up past the waterfall, they wait for another boat. But the boatman only has one engine, which he has to carry each time he makes this trip. We have to make this detour because of the waterfall. Some boats can get by, but they must unload their cargo first. Leaving the engine and canoe behind is too great a risk. <laughs> Jerry prefers to play it safe. His canoe is his livelihood. 50 euros a day, enough to live quite comfortably in the jungle. It's two hours in the canoe between the two waterfalls, then a 30 minute detour on foot to go around. After a full day's journey, the village of Langu appears. 500 people live in these huts of wood and canvas. Time seems to have come to a standstill here. In the jungle, a canoe acts as the school bus. There is no road, but the state hasn't abandoned its people. Okay, let's start again. One, two, three, four, five, six. You start with nothing at the beginning and then your mummy gives you six apples. How many apples do I have? Six. 
At moment, what up, Ixia? Gather your bags. Eh, Katerina. And leave quietly. Feel you eat it. Amy, the teacher, teaches in Dutch, the official language. You got kids in the village never. There are children in the village who have never been to the city, who have never seen a car, who have never had anything other than a broom in their hands or maybe a bicycle. The government subsidizes the school and the village generator. This day, Here's the generator. It runs on petrol. It powers a village over here and another over there. It's switched on at seven every evening. But the next day, the village may be without, as the petrol is about to run out. Once a month, the strongest men in the village are tasked with collecting 4,000 litres of the precious fuel. Which is provided by the government. With six or seven 200-litre cans per canoe, just remaining afloat requires great skill. To work past the waterfalls, the men are forced to carry 20 cans of 200 kilos each for almost a kilometer. Hey, we need another person here. We've always had to do this, ever since the first people settled here. We're not equipped to carry such heavy loads, so it's uh, hard work. It takes the villagers five hours to go around the two waterfalls. Yet, it's a chore that nobody in Langu resents. On the contrary, it helps maintain their independence. Personally, I'd rather live here than in town. There's more freedom. Life in the town is stressful. Everything revolves around work. You don't get to see your family or children. We work hard here too, but it's peaceful. But in a few months' time, Jerry and the inhabitants of Langu might well find the calm shattered. The mayor of the village, Heinz Fredritz, in ceremonial dress, however, believes Langu will be reborn. A road will be built here. We'll finally be spared the misery of dealing with the waterfalls. Vehicles will be able to come all the way here. So a trip that now takes six hours by canoe will take no more than an hour by car. The teacher, who was born in the village, doesn't believe it for one second. The road is a legend she's been hearing about since childhood. 
Since when I was young, you talk, my elders talked about it. And it is, it is in the heart of the people. When they finish the, the road, it is a dream come true. Five kilometers of forest have already been destroyed. As descendants of slaves, the forest is part of our heritage. But we need some more modern things. That's why we're investing in the construction of this road. This is an opportunity for us to improve our lives. This is one day work for one machine, for one man in one day, yes. They might dream of improvement, but the road is a virtual invitation to destroy the forest, especially for the gold diggers. On the banks of the Moroni River, gold hunters Francesco and Pedro are forced to change their dugout to get to their mine. Like the villagers in Longu, they are constantly loading and unloading their cargo. Uh, it's better to take frozen meat. By the time you get there, it will already have thawed. The time it takes to get home, it won't go off. It'll stay fresh until this afternoon. Will it rot? Oh, I'm not sure. And, of course, there's the quad. To get where we're going, it's uh, impossible to take the big canoe because the riverbed is dry and the tide is low. We'll manage with the smaller one. We'll get to the camp today, maybe not in two hours, but two or three hours anyway. If everything goes well, that is, which is rare in Suriname. Especially when the arm of the river is littered with tree trunks. It's dangerous because the riverbed is dry. Maybe in a week, no canoes will be able to use it. Everywhere you feel a bang underneath the boat. Everywhere, everywhere you, you, you feel it. You have to very carefully, especially when the propeller, because this wood is tropical hardwood. You hit it with the propeller, you're gone. Boatmen are all descendants of slaves and never leave their forest. It's a big responsibility, but these boys, at a very young age, they become mature. If you don't go to school, you have to work in the land. Since um, they are small, these boys are coming in the creek because they be hunting, they be fishing, they be cutting the trees and now looking for gold. Go in that direction. I can't anymore. Go that way. The water levels drop dangerously. Pedro has to offload part of their equipment. Hold it. Push. 
I'm going to head off with the quad. The river is not navigable. You have to go another way. And they'll take the baggage and carry on a little bit further. It's no way we can stop. That's the job. Never a calm day. The gold mining region is a land of desolation. Miners such as Pedro helped carve out this secret pathway. It may be the revenge of the spirits of the forest, because just a few kilometers later... My dear, you see, the whole system has died. We need some new parts. New parts? Fat chance of those. The machine restarts, but one hour and four kilometers later. This time, Pedro knows exactly what the problem is. <laughs> it's the petrol. Carburetor. The petrol is of very poor quality. Gasoline, fuck up. now their fourth breakdown in less than two hours. Under the canopy of trees in the middle of the day, it's 45 degrees and the air is saturated with moisture. The couple is exhausted. Hi. Francesca's patience is finally running out. There are times when patience reaches its limits. It makes me want to explode. Help! On the other side, the boatmen are also beginning to tire. Come on, let's get back in. The canoe is stuck. It's because of you, damn it. Because of me. Well, why didn't you leave the canoe over there? The next time you fall in the water, I'll leave you. You're crazy. Where is it leaking? 
Oh, Jesus Christ. My God. Calm down. No, we just need a little help. Stay calm. We can sort this out. The canoes finally reach their destination, followed a few hours later by the quad. This is a kind of illegal river station from where all the Garimperos in the region depart. There are no more rivers at this point. All travel is with a quad. Once again, everything must be unpacked and unloaded. True, it's hard work, but we made it. Yes, we go about barefoot all day. We could have an accident. One day a barrel fell on my hand. See? Here. It's, uh, it's already healed. Injuries quickly disappear. Getting the cargo up to the mine will take them till nightfall. Pedro and Francesca will live here for at least two months. At 6 a.m. the camp begins to stir. All day long the digger devours the earth. It took four canoes tethered together to transport the machine this far. It constantly feeds the metal beast. At this point, I don't know if we'll find gold. Sometimes I find something and other times I find nothing. I do all of this to earn a good living, so I can have a decent retirement. That's why I work so hard. I always said I would never work for a boss. I just work for myself. We may not be earning much, but it's us who decide what we do. I'm stopping looking for gold today. My head is exploding. As in all the countries of the Amazon, Suriname is slowly devouring the forest. <laughs> 